I'd like to take questions as soon as possible. And we've got people with uh, mics who are around the room. Uh, so I just want to make sure, we, do we have microphones? No? OK, sorry. So uh, wherever we get the, the microphones to, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we can keep the question reasonably brief because we'll very brief, be very short time. Yeah, thank you. But a brief tripod question nonetheless. Donald Adam, member of the Institute. The question is for Adrian, please. Adrian. Adrian, what is your connectivity speed, your internet speed in Skibbereen? What is the quality of your interconnection? And how are you involving older people? And I noticed an increasing number of them here in this room. We're all living a little bit longer. How are you involving local people in that initiative? And then for Barry, isn't the rural broadband policy absolute farce? Okay, thank you. Two questions wrapped up together. Maybe, Adrian, if we take you first on that. In terms of the older people, it's a really important for us. Um, that whole community integration and bringing the benefits of digitization is a really fundamental part of what we're doing. We have run specific courses for older people. Um, and rather than introduce them to the entire world of um, digitization, if they haven't had much experience, we try to tailor it towards their needs. So for example, um, one lady who had grandchildren in Australia, we taught her specifically how to FaceTime them, and that has had a huge impact on her quality of life. So it's about trying to find where digitization could actually have a meaningful role in somebody's life. Um, we're also um, tying older people into the whole integration as well, and we're trying for new people coming to the area to have buddies there that would actually help them um, assimilate, I suppose, into West Cork and Skibbereen life and tapping into maybe early retired people there or very active retired people as well who would have time to do that. So we're really conscious of the need to have everybody in the community included. That sounds lovely. Now, uh, before we go to the broadband, because I'm, I'm quite conscious that's very Irish centric and, and I actually really wanted to ask Tonus about, you know, you really had a digital revolution in Estonia and I want to ask you about how do you get that culture of digital IDs out there because it's something that I think Irish people are actually having a big difficulty with and, and you mentioned that you know you focused specifically on education the users the elderly and schools so maybe you could share how you did that um, on a on a national level and, and it might be something that we might learn from yeah thank you uh, first of all with regard to the digital ID yes um, this was really kind of a re revolutionary kind of decision to give everybody a compulsory digital ID. I mean, this really kind of opened the floodgates to develop all kinds of digital services because the only way to get access to digital services is on the basis of an ID. So this, is, this was a very important uh, decision uh, in the end of 1990s. But um, uh, with regard to the uh, educating uh, users, yes, we uh, understood right from the beginning, uh, right from the end of 1990s, that uh, we have to pay a lot of attention to that. Mm. The first step was the comput computerization of schools. It now sounds very, very trivial, but at the beginning and at, in the mid-90s, it wasn't. So it was a kind of uh, good new development. Uh, we started with that. Uh, we started with uh, school kids. Uh, educating them with uh, different uh, computer skills and then also we started to pay attention to uh, older generation to retired people and especially the programs uh, what you mentioned as well the the programs to educate the retired people proved to be extremely popular mm. and the take-up rate was very very high mm. so so and we also I mean we didn't uh, try to kind of cover everything but uh, just the kind of the issues what what were really relevant like um, internet skills and stuff like that so, so this was really a long-term project with a lot of planning to yes, preface definitely, it definitely, mm -hmm. yes. okay thank you um, and I guess with the digitization of schools computerization of schools what you said you probably needed broadband so that will bring us back to that question broadband in rural Ireland yeah, you know. I'm not sure how to answer Donald's question since <laughs> I worked for the government but report to the uh, sec gen for her but um, look uh, how we go about it could be up for debate I think everybody agrees that um, Ireland needs more fiber 
because if we get more fibre in the ground, then we can start to introduce things like 5G and so mm -hmm. on. Um, I think what is really important is that broadband is not seen as an end in itself, it's seen as an enabler. And we've got to rethink how we do health and how we do education. So just to give you a for instance, there's no point in a local school in the west of Ireland having high speed connectivity if the teachers don't have the confidence in teaching differently. Of course that gives us an opportunity and I was chatting to Microsoft for example and I said that when I was a little boy I remember that we, we all used to go on a Thursday morning and sit in the uh, assembly hall and look at a black and white TV. The younger ones will be thinking I'm bad here. But actually, why can't on Thursday morning at 11 o'clock primary school children go and listen to an inspiring TED talk, mm -hmm. which Microsoft or, or, or Esri would sponsor and could be actually run from anywhere in the world? And that's how we've got to think differently. We've got to start to say, what are the new ideas that we can start to talk about because we have this connectivity? And and forget about the connectivity. And that's itself. actually something that Tonus said as well. It's not broadband as, an, as a means to an end, it's the tool. So I think that that's a, that's a really nice thing to, to take from, from the conversations. Now we've, had, we've got lots of hands up and uh, if I take this person, I'd, I'd like to get a, uh, an array of voices if, if that's possible. Thank you. Shurunas Legis from Lithuania. I have a question, um, it's a more conceptual question about uh, all the um, usage of uh, uh, digital technologies for pro provision of uh, public services. Uh, I think the, when you, uh, did, you, did you have any, let's say, calculations cost effectiveness in terms of, uh, let's say, human to human pro pro provision of uh, um, <coughs> public services and having everything in digital space? Because I'm giving you an example, for example, in, in, for me to use all services provided by Estonia as an Estonian citizen, I'm not Estonian citizen, but to, to get all the services, I need computer, okay, 1,000 euros. Telephone, 2,000 euros. Then broadband provision, etc. So I invest a lot myself in order to get this kind of hypo, very useful, quote unquote, useful, you know, technology instead of having that normal service provision going to the counter somewhere, you know, chatting to somebody in the bank or wherever. Okay. So my question is about this cost effectiveness mm -hmm. because a lot of is put on the people, you know, because every year, every month subscription, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I understand that you can provide services all over the world. You have the firms that are working for American market, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for which are working in this field. But overall, this cost the effectiveness in term, from the point of government. Okay, thanks, okay. Lucas. Uh, Roland, so I might give that question to you because similar to uh, Estonia, you, you've developed that, you know, public services. Um, yes. for all citizens. So have you done a, a cost effectiveness um, calculation on those things? Yes, uh, this is uh, an excellent question. Uh, and uh, uh, I will have short and long answer. The short answer is no, we haven't done this calculation. And then <laughs> I don't believe that any country does it. But uh, the question is important uh, because the person has the rights to, to be not advanced in the technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, found this problem and we are uh, solving this problem in Latvia. Uh, we are providing, uh, first we are providing the access to the internet and to the computers through our uh, li uh, libraries network. Okay. We have in Latvia, we have uh, 875 libraries, which are uh, municipality libraries connected in one ne network with quite uh, good uh, internet uh, connection and uh, the, the <coughs> publicly accessible uh, computer is, can also be provided to these libraries. And uh, we, uh, first, uh, the person can uh, can have access to the to the uh, digital environment of, of uh, the e government through through these public libraries, and also we don't think that the person has uh, has to be 
this, uh, this, that the person have to have the skills to work with this computer. Therefore, we are working to educate these public uh, libraries uh, employees. We are working uh, on the assistance, uh, assistant, uh, create, to, for, to create the uh, uh, digital uh, assist, assistance. Uh, for these people who could lead them, who could uh, educate them to show how this uh, uh, e-service uh, e, uh, uh, works, uh, but, but also uh, the, this, this assistant can uh, do this, this can, he can fulfill these, these uh, forms, uh, for, can fulfill this information for the, for the person. So, uh, the, there, therefore, this is not a problem, but from, from the cost-effectiveness point of view, but this is a problem uh, uh, which we have to solve uh, providing the service to the people. So it precludes the person having to invest themselves because publicly available um, items are there that they can, they can use with it. And actually, I think a nice theme that's come out of all of your presentations and answers here is that while the digitalization is bringing everything to that kind of abstract platform, it's actually building on communities locally, it seems, that it, it's, it's required that, you know, if you're in schools, you're working with the elderly, people are communicating with each other directly in order to get these things, that it's kind of actually bringing that advantage to it. Jonas, would you say that from the Estonian perspective, could, could that be a nice mm. outcome of it? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I mean, the digital uh, e-governance is not an object in itself, in a way. It, it, it is a tool, as, as has been mentioned several times. But, but to, to also to respond to the, to mm -hmm. the question about the cost effectiveness, I mean, I don't, I can't give you a number as, as well. But, but looking at the government's perspective, it is definitely more cost effective to provide services digitally because otherwise we would have to keep up the kind of the huge network of you know some kind of government offices it is definitely more uh, costly and from the uh, user's perspective um, all our services are available also in an analog manner you can fill in the tax forms if you wish and present them uh, on a paper form no, no problem that so if you look at the kind of the use usage rate of dif different services I mean, the, the digital take-up rate is never 100%. Mm -hmm. There are always people who use it this analog uh, way as well. So, uh, so it is the choice of the people. We have given them the choice, and most of them use the digital channels, but not all of them. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you very much to our contributors, Tonis Nirk, Adrian Harrington, Roland Stradins, and Barry Larry for their contributions on the digital transformation. Thank you sincerely. <laughs>